All right, let me get hydrated real quick. What a wonderful privilege it is to gather in God's house, to sing to him, even though I'm not that great at it, and to look to his word, to gain that, to gain that sustenance, to gain that feeling that we need. And that spirit, I'd like to ask you to turn with me to the book of Philippians chapter number four this morning. <clears throat> the book of Philippians chapter number four, and we're going to look at one verse in chapter number four, and then we're going to look to some other verses in the book of Philippians as we develop this message this morning. So just the one verse, I won't ask, I won't ask anyone to stand this morning just because we're going to read just one verse, um, but we're going to look at Philippians chapter number four, and we're going to look specifically to springboard our, our message this morning at verse number four of Philippians chapter number four. Philippians chapter 4, verse number 4 says these words. Rejoice in the Lord always. And again I say, rejoice. Now you're going to hear me say this verse many times during this message. So I'm going to repeat it one more time and then you'll hear it later on. Rejoice in the Lord always. And again I say, rejoice. And this morning I want to preach on this simple subject, how to have joy. Let's pray. Merciful God, what a privilege I've said many times, I'll continue to say it is, to gather in your house. And now, Lord, as we, as we come to the portion of our worship service that is central to it, the preaching of your word. Lord, I pray that you'll just speak to us through your word today. Lord, I pray that your Holy Spirit would speak through me. And every bit of preparation that I've made for this will be anointed by you. Lord, I pray that you'll... You'll give me that anointing. You'll give me that boldness from the Holy Spirit to speak to your people what needs to be said today. We thank you for that. We thank you for your word. We thank you for the impact that it has upon our lives. We thank you, Lord, for what it can do when we obey your word. So I pray that we'll obey your word this very day and continuing. I pray, Lord, that you'll search us, that you'll challenge us, that you'll convict us, Lord, and over and above anything, that I could ask, if there is but one who does not know Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior today, that they'll make that decision and choose Jesus Christ, the one, the only way to eternal life. And it's in his name that I ask and pray. The church said, Amen. Amen. Now, I forgot earlier to pray over the, the bottles, Donna. I'm sorry about that. But my prayers are with them, and we, we definitely send them with our prayers. How to have joy. You know, I bet if we was to think about it a little bit, as we, if we were to, as we say in the South, study on it a little bit, we might concede that there are times that we don't have a whole lot of joy. But I'm going to help remedy that this morning with the help of God. You know, the church at Philippi was the first church that Paul founded in Macedonia. And then as to Paul's letter to the church at Philippi, Commentators tell us these words. The letter is a thank you note to the believers at Philippi for their help in Paul's hour of need. What hour of need, you ask? Well, consensus is that Paul wrote this, among other letters, while he was in prison. And the church at Philippi continually, or when they could, he says later on in Philippians, met his needs. So basically, the picture we get here is Paul is sitting in prison, and the church at Philippi is, you might call it, having mission months. And, and each month they have a specific uh, thing that they send him to take care of his needs. And so commentators tell us that the, the letter to the church at Philippi is a thank you note um, to the believers for help in Paul's hour of need. He uses this occasion also to send along some instructions in this particular thing, Christian unity. Now, here's a simple thought. Only in Christ are real unity and joy possible. Think about that for just a minute. In the church, only through Christ are real unity and joy possible. I go on with the commentary's uh, words. With Christ as your model of humility and service, you can enjoy a oneness of purpose, attitude, goal, and labor. A truth which Paul illustrates from his own life 
and one the Philippians desperately need to hear. Why? Because, quote, the, the people in the Philippian church were at odds, and this hindered the work of proclaiming new life in Christ. Sound familiar? The people in the church at Philippi were at odds, and this robbed them of the opportunity to proclaim the gospel. Folks, if we as the church are at odds, if we as the church can't have any joy, how much do you think that hinders us in the work of God? Christian, if you can't have any joy, how much do you think that hinders you from being that visible and verbal witness for what Christ has done in your life and what he can do in others' lives? You know, that's, that's God's purpose in us being here. That's God's purpose in saving us. Some may say, well, God saved me so he can take me to heaven. No, if he saved you only so he can take you to heaven, he would have took you the minute he saved you. But the purpose in our salvation and what we're doing here is so that we can be that visible and verbal witness to what Christ has done in our lives and what he can do in the lives of others. And if we can't have any joy, if we can't enjoy what Christ has done for us, how can we be that witness? So Paul's instruction, or part of Paul's instruction to the Philippian church and to the modern day church, by the way, is rejoice in the Lord always. And again I say, rejoice. We have a problem with rejoicing in the Lord, and it does us no good to deny that because we do have that problem. We see the difficulties around us, and they strip us, strip us of our joy. How do we know that? Well, let me give you some examples. We talked about on the prayer list folks that are dealing with illness. We talked on the prayer list of folks that are bereaved. We talked on the prayer list of people that are having different difficulties. Do you think that might not rob us of our joy sometimes? We see those difficulties and they have that tendency to strip us of our joy. By the way, you know the difference between joy and happiness? Joy is that feeling of inner peace with God that does this, endures hardship, trial, and connects with meaning and purpose. Happiness is based on certain stimuli and it's finite. A minute ago, I talked about graduates, and you know that is a happy time, no doubt about it. But there will come something along that might strip somebody of happiness momentarily, won't it? There's a whole big difference between happiness and joy, and we get those mixed up so much. Let me go, go a step further, though, when I talk about our problem with rejoicing. We've lost the ability to rejoice. We've lost our excitement for what God has done for us. And then that makes us content. You know a synonym for the word content? Content, comfortable. Remember I talked about that some weeks ago. You know another synonym for the word content? Complacent. In the military, we have a saying, complacency kills. Let me give you the picture. Having been deployed overseas, we go through a, a, a nine-month deployment, we come to the end of it, and everybody's so used to the day-in, day-out things that they do, and they become complacent. Next thing you know, what happens? An accident or some other kind of peril? Why? Because everybody has become so comfortable, become so complacent, become so content that they mess up. Contentedness, complacency, comfort, it's very, very toxic to the church. Why is that? Because it makes us so used to everything that we do. It makes us so used to 11 o'clock on Sunday morning, and this is where I sit, and this is when I stand, and this is when I sit back down. And it's very, very toxic because it becomes just something we do, and it strips us of our joy. I told the, the, the folks during um, prayer meeting Bible study one night that uh, we was talking about the, the Lord's Prayer, or what we call the Lord's Prayer, and how... And in some liturgies, they just recite that at the end of their prayer time and how it becomes so rote and it's just something that you recite and it loses all its meaning. That's what we're talking about here when we get content and we get complacent and it strips away our joy. And then the next thing you know, it's just something that we do week in and week out. 
But Paul says, rejoice in the Lord always. And again I say, rejoice. In plain English, it's be in a constant state of joy, not based on the circumstances around you, but based on God's goodness within you. You say, well, I just don't know uh, how I can do that. You don't know what I've been through. I don't have anything to rejoice over. Really? You don't have anything to rejoice over? Or, here's my favorite, you don't understand. It's easy for you to say. Y'all remember me telling you about many times I'll provide pastoral counsel with soldiers, and I'll give them that plain truth. Hey, trust in God, and he's going he's to put you on the right direction, on the right path. And they always say, well, that's so easy to say. Yes, it is easy to say, but it's what we have to do. Here's another of my favorites. Y'all will get a kick out of this one. You're too young to understand. I might have told y'all a story once upon a time. I'm not going to name names. But there was a lady that I went to church with years ago. And her favorite saying was, you never get wise until you turn 40 years old. Well, she was over 40 and, to my knowledge, didn't have a lick of wisdom and hadn't done anything in her whole life. So what kind of argument is that? Y'all see the point I'm trying to make? I don't care what we go through. I don't care the difficulties we face. I don't care things that might strip us of momentary happiness. We can still have joy. And today, using Philippians chapter 4, verse 4, as our, our springboard, as our diving board, if you will, I want to show us some ways that we can have joy, and I want to show us ways that we can keep our joy, regardless of what may be going on around us. You know, it's a beautiful day outside, but that doesn't mean that everything's always going to be peachy keen, does it? In a second's notice, it could be a storm. In life, we could be going along and everything would be great, and before you know it, something comes up. But we can still have joy in the midst of it. And Paul is telling the Philippian church here and telling us that we can have joy no matter what's going on. See, remember, happiness will come and go, but we can keep our joy. Let me go a little bit further. Happiness may come and go, but we must keep our joy. And my prayer is that as we look at these tips, we'll be challenged to rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. And so let's look at what I've named the keys to rejoicing. The first one is this. Be thankful. Pretty simple, isn't it? Be thankful. In Philippians chapter number 1, and verse 3, Paul says, I thank my God upon every remembrance of you. You know, you look through the letters of Paul, and he sure does stress the importance of being thankful. As a matter of fact, seven, including the verse I just read, seven of Paul's 14 letters talks of being thankful for his audience. Let's look at a few. Romans chapter 1 and verse 8. I thank my God through Jesus Christ for you all. 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 4, I thank my God always in your behalf. Colossians 1 and verse 3, we, we give thanks to God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. 1 Thessalonians chapter 1 and verse 2, we give thanks to God always for you, making mention of you in our prayers. 2 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 3, <clears throat> excuse me, I thank God whom I, whom I serve with my forefathers with pure conscience, that without ceasing, I have remembrance of thee in my prayers night and day. Last one, Philemon chapter number four. I th excuse me, verse four. It's only one chapter. I thank my God, making mention of you always in my prayers. So the first key in keeping our joy, the first, the first key in rejoicing the Lord always, and again I say rejoice, is being thankful. Let me ask us a question, folks. How often are we just simply thankful? You know, God does encourage us and require of us, in fact, that we bring our requests to him. He does encourage and require us that we ask him of the things uh, that we may want. He does require that we ask him for the needs that are upon our heart, but he also requires that we be thankful. How often do we say, God, I don't want to beg for anything. I just want to ask, or excuse me, I just want to thank you. Why? Because he's given us breath in our body. He's given us the ability to stand. He's given us the ability to come to the house of God. 
Be thankful. First Thessalonians chapter 5 and verse 18, Paul says these words, In everything give thanks. Now, Paul didn't say for everything give thanks. That's another one that a lot of people get mixed up on. He says, in everything give thanks. Why? For this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. Basically, he's telling us there, it's God's will that we be thankful. That we be thankful. See, God has given us life. God has given us abilities. God has given us salvation. So we must be thankful. So key number one to rejoice in the Lord always, and again I say rejoice, is to be thankful. But here's the next one. Have the mind of God. And you might say, how on earth can we as mere mortal human beings have the mind of God? I'm getting ready to show you. Philippians chapter number two. Starting in verse number five. Paul says these words. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, and took upon him the form of, of a servant, and was made in the likeness of men. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself, and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Wherefore God hath also highly exalted him, and given him a name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, things in heaven, things in earth, and things under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. So that's how we can have the mind of God. Let this mind be in you. Let this mind be in us, which was also in Christ Jesus. Basically, in, in a nutshell, what Paul is telling us in those verses there is to do exactly like Jesus did. Be obedient, be humble, even uh, humble and obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Now, I'm not saying that we have to expect that we're going to die for our faith. I pray that that doesn't happen to us. But we need to be obedient to that point. Having the mind of God. Thinking like God. And oh, by the way, you know some, some, some other way we think like God? How we have the mind of God in how we treat each other. In how we interact with those um, that maybe are not of people of faith. Y'all ever thought of that? How do, you, uh, ha how do you approach those that are not of like faith? How do you approach those that are living in gross sin? How do you approach those that are doing things that are contrary to the will of God? How would God do it? Y'all remember the old bracelet? What would Jesus do? I think that was a fad, a bracelet, of course. But it speaks volumes to those of us that believe in Christ. What would Jesus do? I remind you, the woman caught in adultery, he didn't say, go ahead and stone her. The man with the legion of demons, he didn't say, keep your demons and die. He had compassion. So we need to have the mind of Christ. We need to think like God. That's key number two, to rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. Here comes the third one. This will, this will convict somebody. Don't be bogged down in the past. Philippians chapter number three, verses 13 and 14. Brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth unto those things which are before, I press for the mark, for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Don't be bogged down in the past. You know something? Each and every one of us has a past. Each and every one of us can probably look back in our past and think of something that we should have done better. Think of something we should have said a different way. But you know what? We can't fix none of that. What good does it do us to continually live in the past? I was thinking this week. Um, I have a, a friend of mine and I'm, I'm praying for her regularly that she'll be in one of these seats with her family and I keep pestering her about every two weeks I'll text her and say hey we're looking forward to seeing you and she keeps saying you're going to see me so I'm, we're praying for that I'm going to preach uh, about persistence here in a couple of weeks praying to do that so uh, y'all stay tuned but the reason I was thinking about it is because we've been friends for 30 years and Needless to say, 30 years ago, we were stupid children. And we said things to one another, we did things to one another that we shouldn't have done. And I got to studying about that a little bit earlier this week, and I'm like, you know what? The only answer I could give 
is that we were stupid children, and now prayerfully we're not. And that's what we have to do. We have to get rid of those things that we have in our past. I'm not going to ask for a raise of hands, but if you're honest with yourself and with God, how many of us are still regretting things that happened in the past? But Paul tells us to stop being bogged down in the past. We've all got one. We don't need to live there. You know, I used to tell people in counseling that, you know why we have on our vehicle, on our car, you know why we have a big windshield and a small rear view mirror? It's because we need to be focused on where we're headed. You know, we, we might have to regard what's behind us, but we need to be focused on where we were headed. And so, key number three, tip number three, in rejoice in the Lord always, and again I say rejoice, is don't be bogged down in the past. The past needs to, needs to stay where it belongs, in the past. Because it's, it's, good, it's done, there's no way you can fix it. So move forward. Paul says, I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. You know, Paul had a past. You know, Paul's past very well when he was Saul, the Saul of Tarsus, and he persecuted the church. But then that glorious, it may have been, excuse me, not Emmaus, but um, Damascus Road experience when he came to know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. And then you saw the impact he had there. Did he do that impact by focusing on his past? I would say absolutely not. Or else he wouldn't have been inspired to write forgetting those things which are behind. And reaching forth unto those things which are before. Folks, we need to let go of our past. We cannot live in our past. We cannot be bogged down in our past. If we bog down in our past, our joy will go away. But Paul said, rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say, rejoice. So don't be bogged down in the past. Here's number four. Pray and trust God. Philippians chapter four, verses number six and seven. Be careful for nothing, but in everything. I highlighted that, by the way. So y'all notice my uh, emphasis. In everything, by prayer and supplication, with what? Thanksgiving. Let your request be made known to God. Here's the kicker, verse number seven. And the peace of God, which passeth all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Now, have you ever experienced that peace that passes all understanding? Let me give you an example of peace that passes all understanding. I've heard other people explain this, and I don't agree with the way they explain it. I agree with the way I explain it. When you are in the bed, and you're getting ready to go to sleep, and you're, you're praying, next thing you know, you wake up, and it's morning. I got news for you. That's not the devil telling you that you're too tired to pray. I don't care what anybody says. That is the peace of God that passes all understanding. So we have to pray and trust God. You see, it's not just pray, period. It's pray and then trust God. And you do that, the peace of God, which passes all understanding, will keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Sounds like a textbook definition of joy to me. But you know what the mirror verse to that is? Proverbs chapter 3, verses 5 and 6. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. And lean not unto your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him. And he's going to direct your paths. That, that's especially important when we come to the idea of graduation. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. And lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him and he shall direct your paths. We're talking about the joy of the Lord. We're talking about not losing the joy that God has given us. Number five, if anybody goes to yawn and I'll go faster, but we're almost there. This is another one that will convict you, by the way. Stop focusing on the bad things. Chapter four, verse number eight. Finally, brethren, whatever things are true, whatever things are honest, whatever things are just, whatever things are pure, whatever things are lovely, Whatever things are of good report, if there be any virtue, if there be any praise, think on these things. I would say that about says it all right there. Stop focusing on the bad things. You, got, you know something, the bad things are always going to be there. They're always going to be there. I, I tell people, they're always going to be there so we don't have to worry about them. 
See, we don't have to worry about something's always going to be there, do we? A guy that I used to work for, he used to tell us many times at the end of the day, he'd say, y'all going home, all our problems will be here tomorrow. You ain't got to worry about the bad things. They're going to be there. So stop focusing on everything that's bad. And oh, by the way, stop focusing on everything that can go wrong. We all know things can go wrong. Another thing we ain't got to worry about. Let's think for a minute about somebody who was, I would say, a, an expert on not focusing on the bad things. His name is Job. In the book of Job, chapter number 1, starting verse 20, we read these words. Then Job arose and rent his mantle and shaved his head and fell down upon the ground and worshipped. And he said, Naked I came out of my mother's womb, and naked shall I return there. The Lord gave, and the Lord taketh away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Verse number 22. In all this Job sinned not, nor charged God foolishly. Let me give you some context right there. Chapter number 1 of Job. We know what happened. Job had lost his livestock. He'd lost his fields. He'd lost his family. But did he lay around and blame God? Did he focus on everything that was bad? And I got news for you. The temptation is there. Each and every one of us, we would probably be, be tempted to and probably fall to the temptation to focus on all those bad things. But what did Job do? He said, naked I came out of my mother's womb, naked I shall return. The Lord giveth, the Lord taketh away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Job was not focusing on the bad things. Christian, we do not need to focus on the bad things. They're already going to be there. We need to focus on what's good. And that will be another key. To rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. And now, finally, number six. Y'all can applaud after this. Be content knowing that God's got you. Be content knowing that God's got you. Now, a minute ago, I talked about the downside of being content. This is the upside of being content. Philippians chapter number four, verses 10 through 19. Paul tells us these words. But I rejoice in the Lord greatly. That now at the last your care of me have flourished again. Basically, he's telling the Philippian church that he was thankful for the provision they had given him. He knows there was a time when they weren't able to provide, but now they're able to provide again. You get the picture right there. Now at the last your care of me have flourished again, wherein you were also careful, but you lack opportunity. Not that I speak in respect for want, for I have learned that whatsoever state I am, therewith to be content. I know both how to be abased and I know how to abound. Everywhere and in all things, I am instructed both to be full and be hungry, both to abound and suffer need. Verse number 13, it's my life verse. I can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth me. Notwithstanding, you have well done, and you did communicate with my affliction. Now you Philippians know also that in the beginning of the gospel, when I departed from Macedonia, no church communicated with me as concerning giving and receiving but ye only. Basically, the Philippian church was the only one that took care of Paul as he left from Macedonia. For even in Thessalonica, ye sent once and again unto my necessity, not because I desire a gift, but I desire fruit that may abound to your account. What's he talking about there? He's talking about the fruit that God is promising them because they're taking care of him. Verse 18. But I am all abound. I am full, having received a I don't know how you say this, this, this name, Ephroditus. The things which were sent from you, an odor of sweet smell, a sacrifice acceptable, well-pleasing to God. Verse number 19. But my God shall supply all your need according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. Folks, let's be content knowing that God's going to supply our needs. Now, those needs might not get supplied the minute we ask for them, but we got to keep asking for them. I said I'm going to preach in a couple weeks about persistence. Y'all be sure to be here for that because we're going to talk about that a little bit. But we need to continue to be in prayer, for, in prayer to God, trusting him, knowing that he's going to take care of our needs. Be content knowing that God's got you. Or in a better term, content in God. M let me remind you, not content in what we do day in and day out, but content in God, not in things or in situations. So, rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say, rejoice. A constant state of joy in the Lord. The six keys. Be thankful. Have the mind of God. 
Leave the past where it belongs. Pray and trust God. Stop focusing on the bad things and be content. Why? Because God's got you. And so this is the question I have for us this morning. Do we have joy? Do we have that inner peace and that inner joy that God provides? I know that things are difficult around us, but do we have the joy that God desires for us to have? have? Do you know Christ as your Lord and Savior? Jesus Christ went to the cross to die and pay for our sins, to, to wash our sins away with his shed blood. By the way, not spilled blood, but shed blood. Do you know that? Have you by faith accepted that sacrifice? Maybe you know Christ, you're saved, maybe saved for many years, but you've lost your joy. You're not thankful like you used to be. You're not striving to, to have the mind of God. You're bogged down in the past. You, 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 you're not praying. You're not placing your trust in where it needs to be. You focus on the bad things. You don't realize that God is right there and God has got you. He's supplying for your every need. Is that you this morning? I got good news. Regardless of what category you fall into, you can get back your joy or you can, for the first time, get joy. You can trust Christ. If you already know Christ, you can get back into that right frame of mind. You can get that, that back into that right frame of your Christian walk. Reclaim that joy. Uh, regardless of what may, go, may be going on around you, you can rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. Let's stand to our feet. Our heads are bowed, our eyes are closed. And that's the question I have for you this morning. Do you have joy? Do you know that joy, that inner peace, that no matter what you're dealing with, God's got you. No matter what you're dealing with, God, has, God is making sure that your needs are provided for. Remember, I'm not talking about happiness. Happiness will come and go. Happiness is fine. Right? Happiness is dependent upon different things. But what about your joy? I ask you once again, do you know Christ as your Lord and Savior? Do you know the means of that joy? Do you have the Holy Spirit indwelling you to provide you with that joy? Maybe I said a minute ago, I'll say it again. You know Christ is your Lord and Savior. But through this message today, you've been under conviction. And you, you need to reclaim that joy. You can reclaim it today. You need to know Christ as your Savior and, and gain that joy. You can gain that joy. Philippian church, and he tells us as well, rejoice in the Lord always. And again I say, rejoice. Father God, I've given the message that you've laid upon my heart. And now, Lord, we depend on you for the rest. We depend on you for you speaking. And so, Lord, I just pray that you speak to hearts today. Lord, I pray that if somebody needs to get that account settled, needs to know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, that today will be the day that they claim that promise. And with that, that promise comes the promise of joy, comes the promise of rejoicing, comes the promise of no matter what may be going on around us, that we can still rejoice in you. Lord, maybe today somebody needs to reclaim that joy. They've not lost their salvation, Lord, but they've lost their joy. Lord, I pray that today will be the day that they reclaim that joy. I pray that you'll speak to hearts. Lord, I pray that you'll use this time of invitation for your glory and for your will. Lord, I pray that anything that needs to be laid down today, perhaps it was something I haven't even spoken about, but you've spoken about. Lord, I pray that that'll get laid down, that that'll get settled this very day. We thank you for that. Lord, we thank you for the joy that we find in just simply trusting you. We thank you, Lord, for the joy that we find in that no matter what external stimuli we might encounter, be it bad or be it good, that you still provide that joy. Lord, we thank you for that. Now, Lord, this time of invitation belongs to you. It doesn't belong to me. It doesn't belong to anyone else. But it belongs to you. So I just pray that your spirit would speak. Lord, I pray that your people would be obedient to the speaking of your Holy Spirit. Lord, 
Lord, challenge us, convict us. Whatever you may have done, Lord, may it be done today. In Christ's name, amen. Our hymn of invitation is number 308. Pass me not, O gentle Savior. Is that your prayer today? Do you need Christ as your Lord and Savior? You come. If you need prayer, you come. You need to lay something on the altar. You come. One thing that I haven't mentioned, perhaps you, you know the Lord Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, but you've not been obedient and followed him in believer's baptism. You can, you can settle that this very day. You come as the Lord speaks.